Hey everyone, Mr. Happy here and welcome to Mondays with Mr. Happy, aka Mr. Happy Mondays, the weekly Q&A show where you ask me questions and I answer them. Another week full of struggles for me on my end. Uh, it's getting a little bit out of hand and I definitely got to get a grip on things because the lack of content on the YouTube channel, quite frankly to me, has been unacceptable. But I've been trying to take care of myself a lot lately. Obviously last week I talked about uh, getting some uh, well, you know, watching a few things that uh, generated a little bit more inspiration, but still couldn't quite get over the hump this week, found myself really needing to sit back, relax, but thinking more consciously of it. And that in itself has been a little bit of progress for me. I just like to keep you guys up to date on those kind of things, since it's very unusual for me to go on such a long dry spell of not making any content on the YouTube channel, not even uploading things from Twitch necessarily. As for State of the Realm, that's been all over the place as well. F is set to cancel on Tuesday because he was sick. I canceled on Saturday because I was feeling down and about. And thus, AR Zivia will be this Tuesday, and then we'll be doing the live letter show next Tuesday. That is what the plans are looking like for State of the Realm, and I might make a standalone video on that as well. Of course, thank you to our patrons who have been supporting me through this rough time on top of, you know, I can't say they've really been supporting anything other than these Monday videos because I haven't really been doing much other than that in State of the Realm for this last month, even though there are so many video ideas that I definitely need to hop on. So thank you to them and of course our patrons of Darkness, Kern Ioni, and Kuja Cross on Genova. They have also been supporting above and beyond considering how little content there's been on the channel. So big thanks to them as well. And all of you are still tuning in at least to the Monday videos every week. And those of you who come by the stream and tell me, hey, I saw your 14 videos, those were cool. Really appreciate any of those positive comments, especially in this current time that I'm dealing with my own personal stress and whatnot. But one part that I never ever get sick of doing every week is the Q&A. So let's get into that and uh, put a smile on my face. All right, let's get started. Hashtag Mondays with Mr. Happy. Hello, Mr. Happy. Hope you're doing well. Thank you. Hopefully you're doing well as well. I've been replaying the story through my alt and the Charlene Island comes up with the twins' parents. And my question is, do you think we will go there one day to meet them? I feel like it's talked about a lot, but that's it. Thanks for your time. Yeah, the Charlene civilization is one that has actually been a very big center point of the entire story of Final Fantasy XIV. I mean, our entire, you know, band of friends pretty much was derived of Charlene scholars and thus they have been been a central part of everything. Even other key aspects of the game, Eureka was a largely Charlene inspired thing that uh, came from an old 2.x or 2.1, I think, specifically storyline that was expanded upon. I don't think, I know it's one of those islands I feel like we're never really going to get to go to. Um, it, it, in MMOs, when there's such huge and vast worlds, we want to see everything. And sometimes we can, and sometimes we have to do it in very interesting ways. Uh, for example, there's a large portion of Eorzea in particular where um, the city of Mach resides, and we had to see that through the 24-player raid. And it's fine to be able to do things like that, but I don't know if we're ever going to actually go to Charlian. I feel like there's so many other places people still want to see. Obviously, the entirety of Ilsebard is still a very big one because we didn't get to go there this expansion. Um, we have the New World, which is where Blue Mage comes from, and we already have quite a bit of uh, teases in regards to uh, ways that the civilizations, it's very much like uh, Native America before it was colonized. So we've got a little bit of that going in. Blue Mage actually giving us quite a bit of insight into that. Um, what's another one? Uh, we have Maricidia. We know we don't know how that continent has been doing. From what we understand, it's a barren wasteland where life is barely able to sustain itself. We've got two dragons from Midgar Tormer's Brood that are still completely unaccounted for in that of Vertra and Asdaja. Um, obviously, the other realms are now a possibility. People are talking about what, you know, they wonder what life is like on the other non-rejoined uh, shards as well. There's so much curiosity that I don't know if Charlene's ever going to really rise enough to prominence to get us to go there for anything other than a cutscene or maybe a dungeon. But eh, it's fingers crossed. I would like to go there. I'd like to see as much of the world as we possibly can. I'm just not optimistic that we will. On to the next one. Hashtag Mondays with Mr. Happy. Hello, Haps. Hello. Do you think they'll make the old side quest level sync like they did with Shadowbringers? I think making the Realm Reborn quest sync to level 15 and Heaven's Word sync to 50, Stormblood sync to 60, etc., etc., would help a lot. Currently working on Shadowbringers side quests because I feel like I can get more value out of them. So it's not that they couldn't do these things, but it's that the amount of effort to go back to old side quests and make them more desirable is not something I'm 100% convinced they want to work on. I'm still incredibly surprised that 5.3 is currently their estimation 
for when the Realm Reborn pairing down is actually going to be done. And I do wonder if going back and looking at the main scenario quest in a Realm Reborn, if they'll take any attention to redesign the quests that are the side quests that are available in those level ranges. I think that because of the way those zones are coded, though, there's a much deeper problem here. Um, technical debt from 1.0 that leached into 2.0 and that we've been trying to escape more and more with future zones, but that is still very much present and hard to overcome. Technical debt meaning, you know, old design choices that are very difficult to uproot and, and uh, redo without spending so much effort in delaying uh, current content for the sake of revitalizing old content. It's a very tough thing. It's why the Realm Reborn uh, fix has taken so long. It's one of their one of the reasons they cite very, very often. And such, I, I don't know that this will ever be a large enough priority for them to actually do. I would like it. I think it's a good idea as well. I've got so many side quests that I wouldn't really do just because they're synced, because I already have everything level, but I'm always thinking of the experience for the next person down the line. I think for those people, it would be cool to get an idea like this uh, rolling for the old zones. Next one, hashtag Mr. Happy Mondays. First time asker, hello to you too, by the way. So you have a bonus of one good party finder group. For the few times that I do need them, I will definitely take that. I'm gonna cut my nails. Uh, with there now being four tanks, three range physical, three casters, and three healers that can all share their left and right side gear, do you think there's a chance Greens might rethink the four melee DPS with three different left sides and two different right sides? Do you think the justifications behind it being that Dragoons have the highest defense and no defensive cooldown and ninja using dexterity are valid, or do you think that just having ninja use strength or dragoon have a level one trait similar to tank mastery first of all i don't feel like dragoons having more defense is a good reason ever because <laughs> all the melee dps are still screwed if it's in any serious content you're never like oh thank goodness my dragoon had more physical defense you know i'm actually very much surprised they haven't e equalized overall defense in the game because they, every expansion that goes by, they try to equalize things so that you're never like, oh, well, you know, these types of players take more magic damage, these types take more physical damage. And they've moved away from that. You know, 2.4 Dragoon is really the big time where they fixed uh, a major amount of that problem, but it still very much exists in the difference between magical defense for casters and physical defense for melee DPS. But it's something that I feel like they could just absolutely... Um, regulate and it wouldn't really be that much of a problem as for the actual gear for the melees i would really like for them to that's a lot of reworking of items um that if we did see something like this i don't think they'd rework old gear they just rework the new gear that we're going to be receiving we've seen that a lot when it comes to certain pieces and the way they work like they don't retroactively add materia slots to older items unless they're specifically making note of that old item um they instead just for uh worry about how the next items are going to work and i think in the future it would definitely behoove them to find a better solution for the melee dps because they're just going to keep adding more jobs and they're just going to keep potentially having this problem more and more now the other solution is to add more jobs that can use each of these individual gear sets but that's still kind of a weird thing because if they're not melees, then you've got melees competing with non-melees, which is already a thing for ninjas in regards to their right side gear. You see where I'm going with this. It's just, it's a very weird situation that the melees have worked themselves into. And while we talked about technical debt in the previous answer, this is less of a technical debt and more of a design debt where the decision they made in regards to ninja and in regards to the melees at the beginning of Final Fantasy XIV, or at least at the 2.0 release, have just continued to snowball out of control, and as more gear and more jobs are added, it just gets worse and worse and worse. I have a feeling we'll continue to see loot overhauls, but I don't know specifically if they'll ever do what you're suggesting. I think they'll just keep making it so that gear itself and the choice of what gear you can actually receive becomes more and more in the hands of the players. On to the next one, hashtag Mr. Happy Mondays. Hey Haps, long time viewer, first time asker, all the way from Nottingham, England, the home of Robin Hood. Though I'm not a bird. Two quick fire questions. All right, let's make it happen. One, I recently played and loved Sekiro. I've watched a lot of people play Sekiro and it's something I actually really want to get to. Code Vein is coming out soon too. I actually got to play Code Vein at uh, E3, another Souls-like game, but this one basically people are calling it Anime Souls. Um, and it, it was really good. The demo is out right now, as far as I know, and I uh, would highly recommend it if you're a fan of Sekiro and Dark Souls. Remember your Dark Souls 3 playthrough vids and they were fun to watch. Did you play it? And if so, what did you think? So something that's happened to me a lot on stream lately is games where I don't feel comfortable, specifically with my Twitch chat, have been games that I haven't taken the time to explore. Um, it's actually probably been a big reason as to why I've kind of had this mental block, because there's so many games coming out. There's tons of games that have come out, and I feel like a lot of times I just don't have the freedom to, uh, I guess, 
play those games because I have to think about my livelihood whenever I pick a game to play and present on stream or on YouTube. And it's something I've become more and more conscious of. And I think there's just a bit of that kind of like rolling into my day to day and like thinking about it a lot more. Um, so it's a game that I would love to play, but unfortunately, when I'm dealing with my live Twitch chat and people who very much are open about their opinions in regards to um, where to go, what to do, hey, there's an item over there, don't forget that, the next boss, make sure you do this. Backseat gaming, as we call it over on Twitch, um, it's just not as welcome there. It's not the same as when you're sitting at, on the couch with your friend, your friend goes, yo, 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 what was that? You go, what are you talking about? I didn't miss anything. That's like not the same as having dozens and dozens of different people walk by and basically try to put their hands on the controller as much as possible. It's kind of more like backseat driving than it is, uh, feels like helpful game advice. So it's definitely drawn me away from games like that, where the initial play experience and, you know, getting as much of a, a blind experience as possible is far more valuable to me than the game itself. As for question number two, uh, I'm currently playing Samurai Progression through E2, and I think it still needs a buff. I would like to see Keishi Setsuguka be a guaranteed, uh, Setsugeka be a guaranteed direct crit. Would you like to see this? Do you think it would be too OP? I think all, you know, going back to talking about the melees again, I think all of the melees kind of need a rebalance. I don't think you can just buff Samurai anymore. I think that's out of the realm of possibility. Not because it would be too OP, but because you eventually hit a point where you cannot just keep buffing things. You need to consider the overall balance. And it sucks because nobody wants to hear, oh, my job's getting nerfed. Oh, no one wants to see that, you know, potency reduced in the patch notes, or no one wants to see effect removed. No one ever wants to see that. Everyone wants more shiny, big hitting tools. That's just the way that we function. But it sucks because I feel like Black Mage, Monk, Dragoon and Ninja are all at like this critical point where they're too strong. And you notice I left Samurai out because Samurai is actually very close to a lot of those jobs. And to me, that's a problem. You know, Samurai having this no utility, it, it's really not a problem in a sense that nothing stops you from beating the game with any of these jobs. Uh, no, Nothing stops you from beating the raids other than your own skill set and the people you surround yourself with. But the community perception of those things is very, very important to community satisfaction with those things. And most people seem to be content with the idea that Samurai should be a really strong melee. I don't see anyone really objecting that other than the people going, nah, man, my monk, come on, my monk or my yo, Dragoon, listen, listen yo, you don't need to do that. Don't need to do that, you know? So it's just a really, really tough point that they've gotten themselves in and I'm I don't know what they're going to do. I'm really curious as to what they're going to do. So I don't. I think they could do what you've suggested, but it, it's not a sole answer to anything. You know, they really need to buckle down and figure out where they want the overall balance to sit on those four, like, really, really powerful jobs right now. And I'm really curious to see what 5.1 brings. Next question, hashtag Mr. Happy Mondays. Hey, Happy, how do you feel about, quote, 24 man savage, unquote, content. This will give raid community an opportunity to come together and interact with more people in the same eight raiders. It's also an opportunity for the devs to flex their creativity with harder 24 man content. Wanting essentially the original Crystal Tower, and everyone seems to hate the idea. What do you think? No. <laughs> One of the biggest struggles with large scale uh, content in regards to difficulty is a lot of the times a big portion of the difficulty doesn't necessarily come from. Uh, from the content design, it comes from the number of people that need to be doing it correctly. And I find that the tight eight-man groups are far more satisfactory in regards to A, availability, because finding 24 people with equal availability always sucks in any game, even World of Warcraft, which has been doing large-scale raids for a very long time. The, honestly, the only people who are MVPs ever in those raid groups are the people who put them together, because that shit sucks. And anyone who's led a raid group that's larger than eight or ten people knows exactly what I'm talking about. Um, that's really my biggest concern. I don't have an issue with them developing large-scale difficult content. I think that Baldessian Arsenal, while the fights weren't really difficult, um, it was still a great way to bring about people of all sorts of skill levels into content that, while it wasn't inherently difficult, did place a great deal of pressure on people to be able to perform at this minimum level in order to make sure they weren't wasting their time and the time of everyone else around them. Um, so I'm not against the idea. I don't I don't personally see it happening. I don't personally really want it to happen. Um, but I do want them to flex. I actually prefer the opposite of them to flex harder, small content, like four player content. I've, I've, I've always been a much bigger proponent for that because availability to the people who want to do the harder stuff is a big, big deal. And I can't imagine putting together weekly clears for 24 man Savager, you know, being able to keep people together for that reliably enough 
to uh, to not want to drive yourself crazy without constant replacements every week. I just I wouldn't if I wouldn't lead a 24 player raid. It's selfish of me to want a 24 player raid. I feel because I'm just putting the pressure on the pressure and the responsibility on somebody else just so I can have a good time. Next question, Mr. Ha hashtag Mr. Happy Mondays. Hi. And question. See, they knew I always looked for the hi. Hello. Uh, first time asker, so for free virtual high five. Got it. Damn, that was a pretty bad one. Here, let's do another one. Look at my elbow. Look, look. All right, that was like a 7 out of 10. I'll take it. Question is, with the changes to the loot system and raids and coffers now allowing people to gear up faster from raids, should they remove the cap on tombstone gear to allow players who don't raid to get the max item level at their own pace? Is, is it wrong to feel as though our, time, ah, our time dedicated to the game should feel rewarding even if I don't do raids? Well, they do do this. By the time that you've collected a great deal of tombstone gear in Final Fantasy XIV, it's actually designed in a very deliberate way. So if you're new to 5.x, I'll enlighten you a little bit because I've, I've actually had to have this exact conversation quite a few times on the Twitch stream. So in the even numbered patches, we get a weekly cap tombstone that is capped at 450. Now the rate at which you'll obtain gear very much depends on how much tombstone gear you uh, want and or are willing to try and obtain. Um, it's designed in such a way so that between 5.0 and 5.1, or I guess, you know, the even numbered patch and the next odd numbered patch, a player who isn't raiding will still accrue a great deal of tombstone gear. Now, of course, that's going to be their limit if they're not raiding because they can't obtain Eden Grace gear and they can't obtain uh, the upgrade items. Then 5.1 comes along and these players who want to jump that extra 10 item levels now have weekly and grindable options for upgrading those. You have the hunt, which will allow you to obtain accessory and gear upgrades, not weapon upgrades, though, usually not at first. And then you'll have the follow up for that where you'll have the weekly 24 player raids. Now these will additionally drop item level gear similar to what they've been collecting this entire time. So now they can accelerate the rate at which maybe they wanna gear up another job or they can start to itemize based on, um, you know, what they actually have available. And then they have the upgrade materials that they could obtain weekly if they don't wanna grind hunts and stuff like, and, uh, and the seals that you need in order to actually upgrade them or the nuts in the case of this expansion. Um, so it's kind of just designed in such a way where it's a continuous flow of gear upgrades and side grades going into the even numbered patch and the odd numbered patch. The hardcore players, on the other hand, they max out their item level and they're just looking for whatever challenge is going to be presented and that's where ultimate comes in. The players who are going to be an absolute bis gear going into an ultimate raid in the odd numbered patch, they now have something to test all that gear against as opposed to another gear climb. Now, I'm not saying they couldn't do what you're suggesting. I'm just saying there's a reason to why they do it the way that they do it. And I don't think that they are going to uh, go away from that choice. Next question, hashtag Mr. Happy Mondays. Hello, how you doing? I'm doing all right. You doing all right? I'm doing all right. Bit of an odd question, as a lot of questions are normally game related. Well, this is not a show that is strictly game related. People ask me about streaming and YouTube and uh, personal like food choices, stuff like that. You, you don't have to feel like that's an odd, like it's an odd question because it's not related to a game or 14 in particular. I've been really teetering on picking up. Oh, you're going to let me fucking sell out. All right, let's do this. I'm picking up the SteelSeries Arctis Pro wireless slash Bluetooth headsets, but the $300 price point is a bit hard to swallow without knowing a lot about it. Is there any, if you had any insight on this particular headset, as I do know you are sponsored by them. Not current, but I have the Arctis 5 wired headset and love them. Arctis 5 wired are great. If you're looking to make a wireless upgrade, I always say that these are really convenient headsets, like the Arctis 7 Pro wireless and the Pro wired ones with the game deck. Um, they are clear improvements over the Arctis 5s and the Arctis 7s in regards to quality, but unless you're someone who's a really big audio buff, it's much harder to appreciate the uh, increased hardware versus the convenience. Like, the main reason I use the Arctis Pro Wireless is because of the exchangeable battery on the side here. This is a magnetic pad on the side, so I can just swap it out. Anytime the battery's low, I pull it out. I pull out the replacement battery right here. I'll do the swap. And I just slide it in. That way I get 100% wireless experience all the time. And then I just plug it back. And then I just put the battery in, turn it back on. And I'm all set to go. Ugh. So, hold on. Let me plug, gotta plug the other battery back in. Um, that's the main reason I like these. If you don't care about that convenience, I'd say save the money and get the Arctic 7. Because I'd say that, on, again, unless you're a major audio buff. And if you are a major audio buff, a lot of major audio buffs don't buy gaming headsets in the first place. They look at several of the more audio-focused brands, ones that aren't specifically catered to gamers. So uh, that's my personal recommendation. If you have the 5s and you like them, and you just want a wireless headset, go up to the 7s. Just make sure you're charging them by plugging them in whenever you're not actually at the computer. And you should be okay. 
Next, how many questions? Oh, wow, so I've got a few, a few questions. Only 21 minutes into the recording. Uh, hashtag Mr. Happy Mondays. Hey, Haps, hope your week has been good. Two simple questions. With how much you seem to enjoy Oninaki, eh, it was okay. I was wondering if you played Tokyo RPGs, Factories, other titles, I'm Setsuna, and Lost Fear. If so, who are your favorite characters from each game? So Tokyo RPG Factory, I like to say, is... Uh, they're, they're kind of the run-of-the-mill RPG developer for Square Enix. They make very safe, very traditional uh, RPG titles that follow all the tropes and don't really try to explore any uniqueness, in a sense. Oninaki, I feel, is very much that way, except with an action RPG element. There's some very odd choices about Oninaki, but I felt that the game was... While it wasn't particularly unique, it was desirably digestible. It wasn't too overly complex. It was easy to understand, easy to pick up, easy to put down, easy to understand. And I think that was kind of the thing that Tokyo RPG Factory has done well, even when they've had blunders and other things, whether it be an OST that's way too focused on one instrument or uh, being a redux of an already told story, like I Am Setsuna, basically being Final Fantasy X Redux. I Am Setsuna I'm not a big fan of. I find it to be less... Uh, of uh, I find it to be less satisfying than Chrono Trigger, which they say it was its inspiration. I find the story to just be, again, a Final Fantasy X Redux. I don't find any of the characters particularly interesting or vested into. Um, and the soundtrack being just that piano. It's just nothing adds up for me in Ives Setsuna. It's not a bad game, but it's not desirable to me. Lost Fear, on the other hand, for me, I find is universally better than I Am Setsuna. Improvements to the gameplay, much more freedom in uh, the way that you actually progress the individual characters and the way that you actually express yourself on the, uh, on the the in the actual... Uh, Combat, in the combat, or I was guessing the combat arena, but like in combat, the uh, means of expressing your personal skills a little bit more apparent in that game. The post game is also significantly better, although very weird. It's, it's like they took the idea from Lost Fears post game and integrated it into Oninaki's, but they didn't really understand how to do that. Um, I find that the progression systems in all of them are relatively the same. You know, you have the awakened skills and you have uh, these like random stats on gear. Sometimes they do gear grading as well. It's a very odd combination of gear systems that don't traditionally go with these types of games other than Oninaki. Um, but I find Lost Fear soundtrack to be better, I find the characters to be better, the story to be better. It's a longer game. I just, one thing about Tokyo RPG Factory, and mind you, Square Enix has provided me copies of I Am Setsuna, Lost Fear, and Oninaki. I have not bought a copy of any of those games. That being said, I still think they're $10 overpriced, all of them. I think I Am Setsuna should have been a $30 game, and Lost Fear and Oninaki at most should have been $40 games. Oninaki, maybe even a $30 game. Lost Fear is the only one I could I could possibly see as, at base, worth a $40 game. Um, not just based on hours, just based on overall quality. So that's how I feel about the Tokyo RPG Factory games. I'll still play all the ones that they put out, because, again, they're very digestible. They're very easy for me to sit down, play, put down, and not feel like I have to go too crazy in order to get through them. Um, but at the same time, they're not leaving lasting impressions. So much so, I couldn't tell you the name of any characters. I just played Oninaki. I barely even remember that guy's name. <laughs> because the characters, while sometimes they can be okay in the context of the story, they aren't a cloud. There's, they, they, aren't, they aren't a Tetis. They aren't... Uh, like, I, I guess I could go to another RPG. They're not a... They're not a... What's, what was the guy's name? Oh god, now I'm going to feel so bad for not remembering this one. Because this one's a really easy one. I'm just blanking on it because I'm trying to do it in the middle of the video. Uh, Geralt. I almost forgot Witcher, man. Um, they're not like those characters. They're never going to be like Smash Bro, you know, candidates or anything like that. So I think they could maybe work on that going into the next game. I think they've got the core basics, the safe basics down. Focus on a more enthralling character. One that I'm going to actually remember the name for for once. And on to the next one. Hashtag asking again. I like that hashtag. Hashtag Mr. Happy Mondays. Hello to you too, by the way. Got a question I don't think I've heard been asked. I know they say they don't want any more scaling items with experience bonuses like etherite earrings. What about potentially selling experience boosts? The big issue people have with jump potions is they don't learn the job or learn old content. What if they were in the middle ground like an experience boost similar to the road to 70 EXP boost where you get on preferred worlds? Another option would be, hey, just join a preferred world. Yeah, but they're not always available. Rather, a quick grind and learning experience over the jump points. I think a buyable experience boost would be awesome. Your thoughts? I'm, I'm always against more uh, experience points level skips. I, I'm still to this day, I'm not pro jump potion. I'm not against them because, I, and I feel this way about all experience boosts. If somebody wants to be good at a game, they're going to be good at a game. They can level as fast as possible, as slow as possible. But if they don't have the, if they don't care about playing well, they won't. That's the core thing. 
So like, I'm never for these things, but I'm also never against them. It's this really weird middle ground where I try really not to take a side, even though my personal preference is definitely not to offer more skipping options, very much for the reasons that you've stated here, where I do think there's a better chance of somebody learning the job if they go up gradually versus skipping ahead right to a specific point. So no, I don't think they should do this. I think it'd be better to put in the game better means of, uh, of allowing players to gauge how well they're playing. I think like an end screen at the end of a dungeon, like that says you were the third highest DPS, you were the first highest DPS. If you're a healer, you know, I guess healer is kind of a weird one. It's like you used, you use these buttons X amount of times. Like make, make like, it's, it's really tough because you can't just make requisite numbers of gear press of like button presses, but personal result screens for content, I think would be a really nice thing to have. And it doesn't have to use exact numbers like this was your DPS. It just needs to let you know, if you're a DPS and you go into a dungeon and you get third highest on DPS, then you should know <laughs> something went wrong somewhere. Maybe you died too many times, like track that. How many times did you die? You know, how many uh, AOEs did you get? How many avoidable AOEs did you get hit by? It's a lot of backend work to make something like that happen, but progress reports and then giving you achievements based on having good progress reports would be something I'd prefer to see as opposed to experience boosts in regards to um, allowing people to level faster and skipping uh, and uh, improving player skill. I think they should also just rework experience points through the main story for the periods before uh, Shadowbringers. I mean, even when you're going through the current main scenario, a lot of times you get level blocked, but when you're going up to the previous expansion ones, that's something you really hate to see happen. And that kind of goes back to the whole level syncing side quest and the earlier expansions question. Like that would certainly help with the problem because people would feel a little bit more motivated in regards to actually uh, doing those things to stay ahead of the curve. But I'm just never going to be pro experience points boost or jump potions. I just won't tell you that you can't have them at the same time. All right, we've been going for about a half an hour, so I'm gonna. This one's a lot of text. So I'm actually gonna make this my last question for the week. Again, I'll probably point out a few other questions. Like I had some small ones asked, like what I thought about like a magical melee DPS. I don't really have much to say about that that I, I feel is of much substance, and that's kind of the case for a lot of the other ones that I've actually seen here. So we're gonna make this the last question, and then we're going to encourage you to ask questions for next week's episode of Mondays with Mr. Happy. Uh, looks like the old form's not available. No, we don't use the old form anymore. We just didn't re up it and just went back to using YouTube comment sections. I managed to make it work okay. Uh, I'll put up a TLDR in the front, but if you need any context, you can find it below. TLDR, how would you go about, or not, convincing, but help. <laughs> it's a lot, of, a lot of different terminologies here. An old school MMORPG player to get hyped on Shadowbringers. I see the treadmill for Square Enix has uh, had since 2.0 and it gets harder to justify time spent in the game. I think the, that last sentence, justify time spent in the game. I think that as someone who's played older MMOs, you know, I had my small bout with Vanilla WoW and obviously WoW Classic right now, Burning Crusade era WoW. Um, you know, I've at least gone back. I played a bunch of, I couldn't even name all the MMOs are rotated between, between like 2003 and 2005. But of course, Final Fantasy XI as well. I think as an MMO player, and I know I used to do this, so I'm going to speak strictly for myself and, and try to apply that to what I see from other people. Um, I feel almost as though a lot of people like to, and I quote, try to justify time spent. And the way that something is, quote, justified, uh, doesn't always, I feel like it never ends up being like having fun. It's always like trying to find like a dollar to hour spent kind of justification for playing. Like uh, people, okay, let me, let me say this, like the hardcore raider. They justify their time spent on the game by time spent raiding. You know, that's that's their sole interest. And you know, there's nothing wrong with that. But it's weird when you kind of know that's your one core interest, even when the game has other things you, you know, other people are interested in, that your own interests aren't being met with all the time. And that's kind of all gamers. You know, everybody has a different preference. I love a lot of different content in Final Fantasy XIV. So for me, I don't ever have to quote justify my time to go in. Oh, you know, I'll work on maths today. I'll do a hunt train. I'll, uh, you know, maybe I'll help spawn some S ranks while I'm at the hunt train thing. Uh, I'll do a couple dungeons, you know, oh, maybe I want to desynthesize some stuff. Maybe I want to make some gill. Maybe I want to spend a little bit of time crafting, gathering. Dude, there's, they're adding new gold saucer stuff. Maybe I'll work on that. Oh, a new PVP mode's coming out. Oh, maybe I'll put some time away for that. Okay, I got raid this time of the week. Oh, so people want to do ultimate? Oh, you want to do a raid night for fun? I'm like down for any of that. So I never have to think about this, this thing. But when I played Final Fantasy XI and I played 
Burning Crusade and Wrath and, and Cataclysm, I always felt like I had to find a reason to get myself to log in. With 14, it's the opposite. I always have a reason to log in. It's whether or not I'm 100% committed to wanting to spend my time at that moment and not about justifying the time that I'm spending. I always feel like that the second you have to kind of think of a means of justifying time spent in a game, you're thinking too much about it. It's a video game. It's a form of entertainment. It shouldn't be something you have to justify. You know, it's not like making the decision of, you know, oh, should I buy this brand of milk or this brand of milk? Because I'm used to this brand of milk, but this brand of milk is 20 cents. Like that's you trying to justify the decision to change brands of milk. Like there's too much thought going into that. Oh, sorry, I just almost knocked something over. There's, it's a game. Like if, you, if you're if you not logging in and immediately and going like, hey guys, what's going on? Whether it's you're not social or there's not a piece of content you wanna work on. I'm always of the opinion to just not log in unless trying to convince somebody else to do it. At the very least, if they're a fan of RPGs in general, you go, dude, Shadowbringers, everyone's saying it's got the best story out of them all. You know, there's a lot of world building going up to it. So yes, well, the story's slow, you know, pay attention to all those things. A lot of them come back around later. Oh, you're wondering about that thing. Well, that's this side story over here that evolves into this. You know, you got if you're trying to sell them on Shadowbringers, sell them on the story. You know, the story has been something that has been universally acclaimed as not only one of the best MMO stories within Final Fantasy XIV or otherwise, but one of the best Final Fantasy stories that's been told. It just has a lot of build up before you actually get to that point. So don't even, don't try to think about justifying time spent or this or that. It's a video game. If they like MMOs, if they like RPGs, if they like the type of combat that's in the game, if they like being in a large world, if they like being social, if they like any of those things, that's that's it. There shouldn't need to be a justification. They should just log in and have fun. Maybe play with a friend, progress on a new character with a friend, um, share some memories and just have a good time. You don't have to really think about it so much. At least that's how I feel. And like I said, that was going to be the last question. I actually forgot I said that. And then I scrolled down. I was like, no, really? That's the last question. As I was scrolling through, I was looking through some of the other ones. There was, there was, there was one here where someone said, do you think adding a market board to the Wolf's Ten would make people want to go to the PvP area more? <laughs> Somebody else, not even me, just replied, no. <laughs> and they're right. That would have been my answer to the question. But it's, uh, I just, I don't know. I thought it was funny. And there's a few other ones here. But uh, not really too much else that I can go on. So let's make that a wrap. So thank you everyone for watching this episode of Mondays with Mr. Happy. Be sure to ask your questions for next week. And remember, stay in the realm. Tuesday this week will be Air Zivia live on Twitch at 4 p.m. Pacific like we normally do. The following show will be the following Tuesday. Gotta get back on those Tuesdays for a little bit, at least until 5.1 comes around. So thank you everyone for watching this episode of Mondays with Mr. Happy. Thank you to the patrons. And I will see all of you in the next video. Thank you. And until then, take care.